This meeting is being recorded. Uh, so if you don't want to be on the recording, please you know, stop your video um, and feel free just to listen in. All right, and uh, we will get on with our, our lecture. The topic today is anti-Asian violence in the time of COVID-19. And our speaker is Lok Su. Professor Lok Su is a, a cultural anthropologist, anthropologist and faculty member in the Ethn Ethnic Studies Department at UC Berkeley. Her areas of expertise include Asian diasporas in the Americas, transitional migration, belonging and cultural citizenship, performance and food. Her award-winning books include Memories of a Future Home, Diasporic Citizenship of Chinese in Panama, and that was in 2005, and Asian Diasporas, New Formations, New Conceptions in 2007. And her newest is Chinese Diaspora, Its Development and Global Perspective in 2020. She has lectured at universities throughout the US and Europe in museums such as the Smithsonian, the Museum of Food and Drink in New York City, the Chinese American Museum in Los Angeles, and the California African American Museum. She has appeared on CNN's United Shades of America with Kamal Bell and WNYC's Brian Lehrer Show, and is currently working on her book manuscript, Worldling, A Worldling Asian Latinx, The Intimate Publics of Cultural Mixing. Please welcome Professor Laksu. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, I'm so pleased to be here um, to speak at the uh, homecoming weekend, um, representing, proudly representing UC Berkeley Alumni Association. And um, I myself is also a um, alum alumna from UC Berkeley. I graduated as an undergraduate here. And um, I'm really looking forward to um, speaking with you and sharing my thoughts around what is happening among the Asian American um, population in the US um, and specifically around uh, the rise and uptake of um, uh, anti-Asian violence uh, during this uh, pandemic period in, um, of this year. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen. I have a PowerPoint to share with you and I also have a short video clip. So just, you know, advance notice um, in case there are any technical glitches. Um, and I will also, I'll be speaking through the slides as well as um, afterwards. And I, I should have some time for Q&A, so um, bear with me. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen at this moment. Can everyone see it? Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, the talk for today, anti-Asian violence in the time of COVID-19. So I think many of you are already aware that since the beginning of the pandemic, um, our president um, has been calling the coronavirus, the Chinese virus, the China virus, um, the Kung flu, et cetera. Um, at the same time, he's also been blaming China and accusing it of spreading the virus to the United States. So, I mean, he does not see anything wrong with this issue, with using the racial slurs or even his continued insistence that China is to blame. Um, but at the same time, what we're seeing that, you know, um, in contrast to his sense of innocence of his, you know, um, in, in some ways, um, racial slurs, is an uptake in um, an explosion of anti-Chinese aggression throughout the US, um, you know, since March, 2020, and in, in many cases, you know, throughout um, the world. So what we're seeing here is um, between March, 2020 and June, 2020, um, in just three months, um, we've been uh, seeing 2,100 anti-Asian American hate incident cases. These cases are reported um, to, uh, are self-reported to, um, uh, to the website that's been set up by the um, Asian Pacific Policy and Planning and um, the Chinese for Affirmative Action. Um, we also see that there are 40% of the cases are coming from um, California. Um, and we're, we're pretty certain that these are undercounts. You know, people are not always so easy to confront, you know, to come forward 
to report these cases. And this is something that um, Chinese communities throughout the U.S. have been working on, you know, to, to do outreach to the community to make sure that um, these incidents are actually um, reported and, so, um, and they're documented so that there um, could be um, something done, you know, um, uh, against it. Um, I'm going to show you um, a short clip of the kinds of anti-Asian incidents. I mean, they, they do, they're pretty broad in the way that they're manifesting. Um, you know, they really come from, you know, um, anywhere from verbal abuse to um, uh, physical in intimidation, bullying, and in many cases, they're also um, violent um, attacks, you know, physical assault, you know, of people. So I just want to warn you that this video does have some violence. Um, so before I switch to that, um, just so you are aware, hold on one second. Let me go ahead and switch over to the video portion. young woman wearing a mask is attacked in a subway station. Every disease has ever been from China. It's a oh, are you seeing this? Oh, shoot. Okay. You dirty Chinese. And you just kept saying that over. I apologize. Um, over and over again. I've never felt anything like that. Are you seeing it now? Are you seeing it now? Okay, great. Let me go ahead and... Young woman wearing a mask is attacked in a subway station. Every disease has ever been from China. It's fucking disgusting. <laughs> You dirty Chinese. And you just kept saying that over and over again. I've never felt anything like this before. Why are they being racist to us? We don't even have the coronavirus. Get out! The virus of hate is running rampant. This man and his two children stabbed at a Sam's Club. He was walking down the street last week when four people attacked him. There's been a lot of xenophobia against folks who are part of our Asian community. Many in our Asian American neighborhoods are reporting that foot traffic is down and business has slowed to a halt. It's been unleashed and it's something that I think is fueling anti-Asian sentiment. We don't think that um, the anti-Asian sentiment that we're seeing now is going to go away and we're going to need to address that as a society. Black, Hispanic, and Asian congressional leaders uniting to condemn racism. Come together as Americans. But we stand together as a community. We celebrate our extraordinary Chinese community in this city. And we are proud of that. Please, please stop the prejudice and senseless violence against Asian people. You guys, I'm not a virus. Okay, are we back to the um, PowerPoint? Thank you. Okay, so um, I just want to make a note that um, many of these attacks are not um, only targeted against Chinese or Chinese Americans, but it's really targeted toward anyone who is um, East Asian appearing. So in that sense, regardless of your ethnic ethnicity or your national background, if one looks East Asian, uh, they become very vulnerable to being attacked. 
and oftentimes the um, attackers, you know, are are really yelling and and um, and screaming, um, you know, uh, you know, comments like, you know, you don't belong here. We don't want your coronavirus. You know, please go back to where you come from. You know, you're sick and dirty and spreading the disease. So all these sort of um, discourses accompany, you know, these violent acts, you know, and acts of aggression. And um, so what we do know, you know, from um, these comments along with these attacks is that people are making the association between um, Asian, East Asian appearing people and the virus itself. And so, you know, contrary to what um, our um, President Trump has said, you know, where, when he's continually, you know, connecting um, Chinese to this virus, you know, what, and blaming China for the spreading of this pandemic, um, we're, we do see a connection that's being made um, based on what he's saying, how he's projecting about what's occurring, you know, to um, what's happening with the pandemic, um, and on the ground, sort of how it's being manifested, you know, um, the violence against um, Asians here in the U.S. So, um, you know, out of, I think in the crimes that, in the um, in the the various displays that you've seen um, through the video, there is really a wide range. You know, there there are two particular attacks that I wanted to just share with you that has been extremely violent. One, you know, is the the acid attack against um, the woman in Brooklyn, um, and you know she was just uh, really standing there um, minding her own business, um, uh, you know, throwing trash out. And all of a sudden someone comes by and throws acid on her without question, without whatnot. Um, the other incident that we um, also heard about is the stabbing of a Burmese American man and two of his children in a Sam's um, club in Texas. And, um, you know, these incidents are sort of repeated over and over and over again. Um, you also hear incidents, um, not just in the U.S., but, uh, you know, that's happening in England, in France, in Germany, in Australia. So this is quite um, a global phenomenon, you know, it's not just restricted in the U.S. Um, and, you know, in response to this, this uptake of um, anti-Asian violence, we are um, seeing responses um, from um, from the communities, anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, in March, you know, this is where this is when um, the Asian Pacific um, Policy and Planning Council and Chinese for, for Affirmative Action launched um, a website, a reporting um, center. Um, and if you do a search on that, you know, this is where you can um, uh, you can fill out the form and report the case in multiple languages. Um, more recently, you know, over the summer, we see um, the NYPD created the Asian Hate Crime Task Force because they're seeing such an explosion of cases, you know, of anti-Asian violence. Um, in Los Angeles, they're now also launching the um, LA versus Hate campaign. Um, and um, here in the Bay Area, San Francisco is also considering setting up some sort of task force to address um, this this outbreak, you know, of um, violence. So, um, let's see. In this talk today, what I what I want to explore is, you know, how do we make sense of this? You know, this recent rise of anti Asian violence. Is it caused by only the pandemic or the framing of the pandemic as being, you know, the fault of Chinese and Asians? And I want us to think about that because this is sort of what's been um, uh, largely um, talked about, you know, in, in the media, you know, the way that we're framing it is this is part of the pandemic and, um, and a result of, you know, um, the discourse around um, who is causing this, uh, this pandemic, you know, who is at fault, etc. But here I want to just step back and say, um, you know, there, there are actually um, a number of different factors um, that in fact, you know, to understand this current of anti-violence, um, uh, you know, within a pandemic is a, is a rather um, narrow kind of approach that we really need to take a broader uh, perspective on this. And um, one, um, you know, that it's not new, it's a, um, it is not unique to this moment, but it has long um, historical roots. And we have seen these um, incidents, these outbreaks of anti-Asian violence throughout American history. Um, the other thing is that we really need to um, understand the current 
moment, you know, beyond the pandemic, but really what's what's occurring, you know, in the past few years. Um, and so looking at the, the current geopolitical um, and, and, and social political economic situation in the U.S. is also important, you know, that I think there, there, there are these factors that we need to consider. Um, I don't think it's wise for us to think that once the pandemic is over, that the violence will be over. Um, I think there is, uh, there are under currents, you know, in our society that I think we really need to seriously address. Um, so um, let's get to that now. Um, my, my own thinking is that what is contributing to this, to this uptake, you know, in violence is yes, um, the pandemic is a trigger, you know, but not the, the root cause. Um, and really, we need to take a look at the longer, the ideology of yellow peril that has been with us, you know, from um, from the 1800s forward, you know, and so um, so that we need to consider the yellow peril is really an expression of um, Western fears of a um, you know of an Asian um, uh, dominance of Asian takeover or or Asian um, threat. Um, and, you know, we'll, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute um, to show you how this is manifested, you know, how this is, how this is um, understood, you know, um, or displayed in um, American um, media uh, and popular discourses. Uh, and this is, I, the ideology component is, you know, again, the undercurrents, you know, that is more trans-historical, you know, that really is, um, has been with us, you know, for, um, for decades, if not centuries. Um, the second aspect that um, I want to want us to focus on in a bit is also the current social political context, really um, particularly framed by the China U.S. economic competition, um, especially you know at the turn of this century, the 21st century, right? Um, so let's get on with um, the discussion around the ideology of um, yellow peril. Uh, so the idea, the concept of yellow peril, I think, you know, there is much um, uh, debate or discussion around, you know, where, where, when, how exactly did it come about, but we do see a, um, you know, some historical um, materials and, and archives to indicate that, you know, really it came in around the late 19th century, you know, in real uh, force. And here is an image um, uh, that that is you know that has been popularly sort of used to show uh, the the encapsulation of the rise of the yellow peril ideology around the turn of the um, between the the nineteenth and twentieth century, and and this is a moment where um, uh, where Europe was beginning to notice Asia much more. Um, at first, it was, um, it was, you know, th uh, a f an expression of fear against China, and it quickly also um, became a f an expression of fear against Japan. Um, and this is, uh, and remember that the, the turn of the century between the 19th and the 20th is when um, Japan really rose as a military pro uh, power. Um, when when Japan um, actually fought in a war against Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, it was a surprise, you know, to Europe, to Europe and the U.S. that the Japanese um, defeated um, Russia in many ways. So in this picture, you have um, Buddha right here, far off, you know, on on the the right side of the image, and um, the the archangel here bringing together the Europeans. Um, uh, represented by these female characters to say, oh, here, there, you know, the, the East is rising, you know, the, um, the, the heathens, you know, and the East is, is coming, you know, to the West. And so it's this incitement of um, the beginning of incitement of fear. Um, um, you also, you know, within the U.S. context, you know, you saw a sort of wide array of popular culture that were emerging, you know, um, that uh, that visual that offered the visual representation of this fear of um, the yellow peril. You know, here you have an image of a um, Chinese person, and this is, you know, you can see the cue that is representative of the Chinese and um, standing over a, um, uh, what, is, uh, what, what is considered a white European uh, or white American woman. 
right? And so you had, this is only one image. I mean, there's been, there's so many images that were circulating around that time um, that, um, that fueled um, the fear, you know, around um, uh, Chinese immigrants. Um, another type of images that were also circulating were the fact that, you know, the Chinese um, um, had multiple vices, right? That, that there were um, opium smokers, that they were involved in um, gambling um, activities. And, and yet at the same time, they're sort of hidden among all of us, you know, in, in terms of being uh, workers, being um, laundry workers, being um, restaurant workers, etc. So there's this sort of, you know, under the, underneath what is, um, what we see in, uh, you know, as Chinese workers are actually sort of these um, deeper, um, more, um, uh, more insidious sort of activities. Um, and that's, again, uh, fueling the fear of um, Chinese um, uh, in the U.S. And um, similarly, there are also images of um, economic competition. You know, here you have this, this um, commercial um, uh, cartoon um, promoting George D's magic washer. And um, it's the, the image itself is aimed to displace Chinese laundry operators. And, you know, you see the captions on the bottom and in the very top right corner, um, one saying the Chinese must go and um, the other saying, you know, don't use this if you want to be dirty. And, you know, all these sort of um, discourses and visuals were, were coming together at, you know, um, converging um, at uh, around the 1870s, 1880s, you will see also um, what, what, what caused this convergence, I think, um, hold on, there's another, what caused this convergence, um, in particular to the disease outbreaks, um, that the, the coming together of disease and the Chinese bodies. Um, there are two, um, two uh, vectors that I think we need to look at is one is the disease outbreaks in the late 1870s onward. You had smallpox, you had um, leprosy. Um, I think the other one is, uh, is malaria. Um, but, you know, there were a number of other, um, cholera was another sort of disease that were out, you know, breaking out in the um, late 1800s. This is also the moment where, um, you know, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad um, was in 1869. And with the completion of the railroad were, were um, uh, Chinese laborers that were working there were suddenly um, flooding um, the cities, you know, the communities where um, now the Chinese workers were coming to um, Chinatowns, you know, um, in Los Angeles, in, um, in Seattle, in San Francisco, and other places, you know, uh, to look for work, you know, to join um, um, the Chinese communities now that they no longer are working in the rural areas, you know, to build a railroad. So you had these two conversions, and um, the the result of that is um, you saw not only and uh, the scapegoat the medical scapegoating of Chinatown in the late 1800s. You also see uh, you also see we also saw a rise of anti um, Chinese sentiment, you know, coming from the labor class, right, where um, many of the white American laborers were um, were fearing um, a displacement of their. Uh, of their jobs, you know, based on these new um, Chinese laborers coming in. And so you see, uh, it's just sort of a, um, a spike in, um, in riots, you know, throughout the US. You had the LA riots, the Denver riots, the Spring Rocks riots, Tacoma riots, Seattle riots, etc. So you had all this, again, you know, a historical moment where um, this anti-Chinese violence emerged, you know, at, um, at the at both the economic moment, um, uh, you know, as 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 an issue, and also the the medical um, public health issue that was emerging in the late 1800s. Um, you know, the ideology is further also um, spurred, you know, and continued by popular cultural writings. You know, you had Sax Romer, the author who was coming up with uh, the characters, the whole sort of series around Fu Manchu. And um, this was, you know, this, 
this is a really a, had a long standing, you know, in popular culture. They, they came out as books and novels, and it also um, came out as films, you know, that were distributed globally. Um, Sax Romer himself is British, and um, much of his writings, you know, were circulated throughout Europe and and uh, and the U.S. and and you know this was really at the turn of the 20th century, you know, to um, really today, you know, the Fu Manchu character is such a uh, such a stereotype, you know, that we hang on to, um, and it's still a very powerful one in conveying sort of the insidious, you know, genius, um, evil, you know, these hidden sort of um, uh, devious plans of the Chinese, you know. Um, to attack and um, dismantle sort of the West. And it really does capture and fuel the fear, you know, around um, uh, Asians, you know. Again, this is, um, this is a character that is supposed to be um, Chinese, but appearing in his sort of army of minions are, you know, sort of a very multi-ethnic group of Asians. Um, so, and it, it becomes the stand-in to sort of uh, be the representation of um, Asian fear, Asian um, threat. We see this emerging as well, you know, of course, during World War II. Um, here are some images, you know, of Japan. Again, this is a continuation, you know, of the Yellow Peril ideology as it appears through visual culture, um, through discourse, um, et cetera. And I, and, and, and I want to say that this is so embedded, you know, in our American psyche that, um, that any sort of trigger, you know, I think, um, such as the, the current condition of the pandemic is causing, you know, these upticks of violence, right? Because um, this, is, this is embedded in our psyche. Um, so I want to also then move on to talk about, you know, you know what I've been saying so far is really the historical context of um, the ideology that has been, um, that is rampant, you know, within our society throughout, throughout um, the 19th, 20th, and into the 21st century. But what makes this particular moment unique is um, really the heightened um, intensification of the China-US economic competition that we're experiencing at this moment. Um, and I, I want us to, you know, to, just to take a, a one moment to think back in 2018. Um, I think if I were giving this talk in 2018, it would be a very different topic. Um, I remember, you know, in, in the fall of 2019, when I was teaching one of my courses, we were talking about Crazy Rich Asian, you know, the Hollywood film. And um, that's a very, very different moment when you think about it in Asian American sort of representation. Um, and just think like that was two years ago. And within between this period of 2018 to now, we see a sort of dramatic switch, you know, between those representations uh, that gave us, I think, a glimpse, a possibility that, you know, Asian representation is finally making into the mainstream that perhaps, you know, it's becoming more and more accepted. Um, we have this, you know, um, this reckoning at this moment of what what is happening. Are Asians a part of Asian American, a part of the American society? And a lot of this, you know, is really um, the doing of the um, China-U.S. economic competition that has been expressed, you know, in trade tariffs. You know, in 2018 was when we begin to see um, the U.S. and China um, sort of going on a face-off face of trade tariffs. You know, China would be um, putting on tariffs. Well, President Trump was the one who started it. And then China would return with another set of tariffs. And then there's an escalation, you know, of these um, trade tariffs and this notion, you know, that... Um, China is uh, is taking advantage of the U.S., you know, and gaining the upper hand in um, the global political economy. We also see um, uh, an uptake in the um, intellectual scientific property theft question, right? In um, 2019, if you do a search around um, 2019 of Chinese American uh, uh, you know, scientific property theft, you will come up with a set of articles, news articles around um, issues of um, uh, accusations against Chinese American researchers. 
um, scientists, you know, and major research institutions who were being accused of um, espionage, being accused of um, intellectual theft, um, et cetera. And um, most of these cases, I should say, is has not um, been proven um, by any means. Um, uh, in fact, you know, uh, uh, what um, what we're seeing is uh, that for the cases, um, this is this is when the FBI actually worked closely with the NIH to crack down um, uh, on. Chinese American, Asian American um, cases. And there were over 176 or plus cases that were being pursued and around 82%, oops, here, I'm sorry. Here, uh, the, this is the, the slide that represents it. Um, the NEH had inv in investigated at least 180 scientists um, at more than 68 institutions. Mo most of them, but not all, were ethnic Chinese um, scientists. 82 were investigated, um, were Asian, um, of Asian descent, and um, and many universities have come up to come out to um, speak against it. Sorry, this is MIT, Yale, UC Berkeley, uh, along with other universities, have sp spoken up against the racial f uh, profiling of um, Chinese American um, scientists. And just to um, jot your memory here, you know, it wasn't too long ago that um, Dr. Wen Ho Li um, had been arrested, you know, and accused of similar things. Again, proven innocent, you know, at the end. Um, so here again, we see the emergence of this. What's also really problematic that alongside with, um, with what was going on is um, FBI um, director Christopher Wray had, was giving, I mean, this is only one speech that he gave, but this is the speech that he gave at the uh, Council on um, Foreign Relations speech, um, in which he um, sort of came up with this idea of the whole of society approach. And, um, you know, he's been quoted by, you know, saying as China has pioneered a societal approach to stealing innovation in any way it can from a wide array of businesses, universities, and organizations. Um, so what we're seeing here is whereas I think the Cold War was fought, you know, on, uh, on you know, by armies, by governments, you know, by military, um, uh, by the military, what we're seeing today, um, you know, this trade war is being waged, um, is this notion of um, you know China sort of taking up the whole of society approach, meaning that anyone, you know, your neighbors, your a student, a graduate student, a faculty member, a researcher, a scientist, a uh, an executive, a CEO, any of these people can be acting on behalf of China, you know, and this is what he has dubbed a whole of society approach, and this is actually quite quite stunning, you know, when you think back to um, what happened with, um, uh, with the Japanese internment, you know, um, here in the U.S., you know, where's a similar idea of, um, you know, Japanese Americans, men, women, and children were seen as a national security threat, and they were, um, you know, all sort of put into um, camps um, and, you know, in the name of national security. And, you know, this is very resonant with what um, had occurred then. This is also very resonant, if, mind you, you know, of the Fu Manchu, you know, character of sort of the evil genius, um, you know, the meddling um, genius of Fu Manchu. Um, uh, yeah, so what, you know, so this is, again, really dangerous in a sense that, you know, what does this look like for society where, you know, over 5 million citizens are of Chinese descent, many of whom are working in science and technology um, you know, so, I mean, this is a question that I think we have to um, reckon with, you know, for some time um, now, um, at this point forward. And um, I want to also then um, call our attention to the third aspect, you know, of the U.S.-China um, trade war, that part of the discussion, part of the discourse is around the cybersecurity and techno security that um, we're seeing emerging as a powerful discourse in the U.S., Right. And um, again, you know, starting in 2018, we see this condemnation of um, against Huawei, 
um, the transnational, you know, Chinese corporation um, that is really at the forefront of doing 5G um, networks, right? Um, and uh, President Trump and his administration has really come out very strongly speaking against Huawei, um, claiming that, you know, Huawei um, might be uh, associated with, um, with the people's, um, uh, people's army in China and that, uh, that there's a, a security threat involved, you know, if um, businesses are doing with Huawei, you know, that you are, that businesses would be vulnerable to the kind of um, espionage, you know, and um, uh, uh, security issues. Um, because, you know, when you think about it, you know, what the 5G network is, is a, a wiring, you know, a, a sort of infrastructure that is built, you know, for the communication systems into the future. And um, again, you know, um, President Trump has, has targeted Huawei in particular, you know, to make that, to, to make them be the, the culprit, the possible culprit, right? Uh, never mind what we're doing here in the U.S., um, you know, with our sort of security systems, with the breaches of, of um, uh, you know, uh, uh, private, private uh, um, case, uh, cases like um, Facebook and uses of our own personal information, right? Um, we saw recently also, you know, his attack against um, TikTok and um, against uh, WeChat as well. Um, you know, the case with TikTok, I, I think is, is worth uh, bringing up. I think it's a, you know, if it weren't, um, if it weren't so drastic, I would find it funny. You know, um, I mean, TikTok is, as you know, really popular among um, the younger generation. And part of, I think, part of the reason why um, the White House, you know, um, administration has gone after TikTok is precisely because of what um, TikTok was the platform that was used by Korean um, pop, pop, um, pop culture artists, you know, and um, pop culture followers, fan groups, to um, register themselves for one of the rallies, right, the Tulsa, Oklahoma rally, and, um, and, and, and they were false registrations, so that, you know, there were numbers of people registered, but no one showed up, and it was a, a great um, embarrassment, you know, uh, you know, for that, for that low turnout. And I think it made an Im impression, you know, um, on um, President Trump. And um, that was one of the first, another first company, you know, um, that was attacked, you know, uh, um, and it's a Chinese company, you know, once again, Chinese, Chinese based company. And uh, more recently, we have also the, uh, the attack against uh, WeChat, right? So we're seeing more and more, you know, as we uh, are moving, uh, you know, this is a moving target, you know, you have the pandemic, you have the, um, the, uh, the, the attacks against the Chinese sci scientists, and now you have the tech companies that are being attacked. Um, and um, I think all of this sort of really creates the, the conditions, right, the climate, so to speak, of anti-Chinese, anti-Asian sentiments. And uh, we really need to, um, you know, look at this as a multi-pronged kind of, um, of all these vectors and convergences coming together and creating this um, environment where I think there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety um, that are being created and generated and fueling um, these um, acts, random acts, you know, of, um, of, uh, of violence and aggression. Um, against um, Asian Americans, you know, more broadly. So I, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I, I would love to engage with all of you, you know, in a conversation. Um, if you have any questions, you know, any um, feedback, etc. I really um, am interested um, to hear from you. So let me go ahead and um, stop my chair so we can have a conversation. Yeah, so please put your questions in the chat. Um, <clears throat> just to start off, what other aspects of anti-Asian sentiment are being displayed other than violence? Um, I think you know, there's, it's so multi-pronged. You know? I mean, I think the most immediate that we're uh, witnessing is sort of these random individual acts you know, of um, attacks. I mean, we see this circulating in, in the media as well. I mean, there's so many reported um, videos, you know, whether it is coming from 
um, people sitting in the cars that that you know that are being shouted at from by someone, joggers, you know, that are being shouted at, um, to even you know doctors and nurses who are Asian American, you know, they have been also um, verbally attacked by the very patients that they're working with to say, you know. Um, you, you know, why are you bringing this coronavirus? You know, this is the irony, you know, um, the, the very sort of um, uh, horrible irony, you know, in, in this situation. Um, but aside from these individual attacks, you know, we're also seeing um, cases where uh, Asian American businesses, you know, are really um, becoming an issue here. You know, Chinatowns, you know, from the very beginning of the outbreak, we're beginning to see, you know, uh, a complete, um, uh, um, uh, you know, shutdown of their businesses. People are not going um, into Chinatowns, despite great efforts, you know, by I think local officials to say this is not true. You know, um, the Chinese and, and the CDC has come up to say that too. The Chinese are not more. Um, more prone to contracting the virus, you know, and, and we support, you know, sort of Chinese Americans and Asian Americans. Um, and um, you, they're, they're, they're beginning, we're beginning to see, you know, the real effects, the closing of Asian American businesses, you know, all over, especially businesses, you know, in um, Chinatowns throughout America, you know, New York um, and San Francisco are, are heavily hit, um, as well as in other places. Very good question came in from Victoria. It says, what can we do or how can we get engaged to help with this issue? Um, you know, I think, again, um, you know, if you can to speak, you know, if you have access to community and um, people around, make sure that they're reporting it, you know, and I think that any kind of, um, uh, you know, any kind of abuses should be noted. Um, I think talks like this, um, you know, uh, media, you know, whether you are doing it on um, Twitter, Instagram, or um, Facebook, you know, any kind of platform that you have access to, it's important to convey this message, right? And to say, you know, that um, really this is a, a, a misguided kind of um, uh, notion, you know, that the, the Chinese are doing this and that, you know, really people are suffering I mean, you're talking about violent acts, you know, uh, people are fearing, um, you know, uh, to go out the streets. People don't want to go out there. I mean, so many of the, our communities are uh, hiding, you know, so that they don't want to be physically attacked because you, you, we don't know, you know, um, anyone is vulnerable to it. Um, and so I think doing that is important. And of course, you know, get out and vote, you know, really good, get out and vote and uh, become active citizens, engaged citizens, you know, through um, the ballot, but also through the different media that we have access to, you know, whether it is in the classroom, whether it is, you know, in our workplaces, um, in family gatherings, um, other organizations that you're, um, that you're engaged with, you know, it's really important to kind of um, get this, um, you know, counter message out, um, working against, um, the prevailing kind of um, misconceptions, you know, that's out there. Very good. Okay, next question is from um, Marion, I believe. I hope I didn't mispronounce that. Do you have suggestions about ways to surface faulty assumptions and counteract the unspoken assumptions that are driving abusive language and physical violence? Yeah, um, I mean, there's there's so much to be um, done, <laughs> and there's no one answer. Obviously, you know, I think that um, uh, uh, there's uh, you know we could write more, write op ed pieces more. You know, we can um, we can uh, you know again engage in um, various media platforms to get the message out. I think the whole point of why. Um, this is happening. There are two things I think that we really need to um, address in those ways that we're, we're, we're creating messages. One is um, humanizing, you know, Asian Americans. I think that there's so many um, images out there and, uh, and misconceptions out there that is based and rooted in this notion that, you know, Asian Americans are seen as lesser, you know, as inferior. Um, and also as foreign, 
You know, I think this is this is really key that you know somehow Asian Americans are not seen as um, really fully belonging to American society and American nation, and that's been I, this is something that we have been you know fighting against you know since the enactment of um, the Immigration Acts, Chinese Immigration Acts, you know, in the 1880s. Um, and this is something that we have to continue to fight. I mean, there, the, one thing is, is, is working on laws and policies, which, you know, I think we have, um, we have done. But the other thing is to change the minds and hearts of people, which is a much harder thing to do. And this is, it takes a cultural change, you know, um, which has to be done, you know, in, in all aspects, you know, whether it's through history books, um, history classes, um, everyday life, you know, when you hear something, say something, you know, um, when, and, and just getting ourselves out there, you know, t- um, and humanizing, you know, um, Asian Americans and seeing that we are part of American society, you know, we're not foreign and we do fully belong. We are one of, one of, you know, we are Americans, you know, I think those are important messages to put out in whatever platform, in whatever instance that I think um, people have access to. Very good. Okay, next question is from Elaine. And she asks, how do we as Asian Americans help to become less, quote, other? Asians are politically adverse and we are a diverse group. Um, we are a very diverse group. <laughs> um, and, you know, there is not just one... Um, you know, ideal, ideological position that all Asian Americans, you know, um, take on. And I think that has, that is a challenge. Um, and, but that is so for all communities, right? I mean, I don't see, I don't think, I can't think of any one community that has only one viewpoint. Um, and I think that what, um, what we need to um, fight against also is the idea, um, you mentioned the politically adverse. And um I think that's been a misconception. You know, I think that if we look at um, history and, you know, what we have in the archives, um, you know, whether it's in newspaper articles or whether it is in history books, um, community organizations, we actually see a very robust history of Chinese um, and Asian involvement, um, political involvement, political organizing. Um, on the ground, as well as, you know, um, uh, major organizations that are working, you know, to change policies um, and to advocate and inform and educate, you know, the the broader public. And I do want us to rethink that, you know, Asian Americans are not politically adverse. We are not. I mean, we are, there is a lot of um, activity going on here, but there, but there isn't one. It's contentious. You know, I will say that it is contentious, um, uh, but um, but you know the, the idea that Asians Asian Americans are politically adverse really goes along with the um, notion of uh, model minority that somehow we're silent, more silent, more passive, more you know less assertive, and we don't care. Those are those are false assumptions. I think that there's an for everything that 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 um, is out there around um, that pre- preconception. There's also an equal equally long list of um, counter arguments and counter um, uh, uh, events that show that we have not been. So I just want to say that uh, that we need to just um, you know go at it, continue to be at it. Okay, we've got a few more questions. We've got a a little under 10 minutes left. Next question is from Amy. She she asked that the anti-Asian sentiment that you spoke about during the last two centuries seems to mirror anti-Semitism in some ways. The notion that Asians or Jews or any other minority are secretly active in orchestrating some kind of takeover. Can you speak to this similarity and other similarities across minority groups? Uh, yes, I, just because of the time, Mike, I was wondering if you can read all the questions and then I'll try to. Perfect. You know, yep. And then the next one from Edward, how does this phenomenon fit or clash with model minority myths? Is there an element of resentment of success? Um, <clears throat> and then uh, Ben, who works for the mayor's office in Washington, D.C., asks if you have had contact with Mayor Breed's office. And if so, have you heard anything about the status of the task force they want to put together? 
And then the final question is, uh, Timothy says, Asian is a sizable group in UC Berkeley community. Have you noticed any related negative impacts on Asian and or foreign student admissions and on researcher, researchers or professors of Asian descent? Those are all very, very broad um, <laughs> questions. Any one of those could be a lecture in itself. Um, yes. so I'm gonna try to um, uh, uh, answer them um, at least as, you know, as briefly as I could to touch upon all uh, those issues. And, and, and I didn't write them down, so I'm gonna try, you know, you might have to repeat them to me, but um, to the first question, you know, of um, the relationship, you know, between Asians, Asian Americans, and, um, and Jews. Um, I think that uh, in general, I think for, DS there's a common, um, uh, I guess, phrase, you know, um, what is it? The Chinese or the Jews of Asia, right? Um, and I think it, it, it has historical roots in a sense that um, Chinese, uh, diasporic Chinese, you know, all over uh, the world, um, have been um, uh, active in being sort of the, in, in the service industry, you know, for uh, in, in, in the economic sectors. And they've always been seen as sort of the, the, the middle, the middler, right? Um, uh, and, um, and, you know, when you think about restaurant owners and laundry workers as sort of, sort of those two uh, particular um, uh, typical um, sectors that um, Chinese, um, diaspora Chinese have been in really globally, when you think about it, um, uh, is sort of typical of the, the kind of position that Jewish um, diaspora Jews have been in, you know, this sort of middle merchant um, position. And a lot of it is, you know, also going back to the colonial times where um, Asians are often usually brought in as sort of that um, that middle, um, uh, you know, position workers, you know, and they've been used sort of as a wedge, you know, in American society. Uh, and I think we also, you know, see this um, in, in other ethnic groups as well. You know, I mean, I see um, sort of uh, connections to Latinos, you know, as well, um, uh, you know, as uh, other um, Arab Americans, you know, um, South Asian Americans, etc. And is this sort of um, position that Asian Americans have occupied, in fact, oftentimes used as the wedge, you know, between um, the elite or um, the colonial class and sort of the the native or the um, the uh, the the lower class, you know, of people. Um, in relationship to uh, the question around um, the model minority, is exactly that. You know, I mean, the modern minority is a 20th, 20th version, 20th century version, you know, of, of, of the articulation of this middling position, right? This notion that um, uh, really that emerged in 1969 um, that came up to um, say, you know, Asians uh, is Asian Americans as an ethnic group had all the cultural, you know, all the cultural elements and behaviors, and therefore look at them how they have succeeded because of their, um, of their cultural values, as opposed to, I mean, that this is the point that they, as opposed to other racial minorities that have not done the same you know, that have not had the same level of success. And this notion of model minority, again, is used, you know, to exploit, you know, those divisions, those racial divisions, so that you see um, so much of the conflicts that are emerging, you know, among the, the minority, um, ethnic minority, racial minority groups, you know, where Asians are sort of put in a pedestal to kind of, um, on the one hand, um, uh, say, you know, you know, the people who have not succeeded, the racial minorities that have not succeeded is because they haven't done so, you know, um, on their own accord, because look what Asian Americans have been done, have, have done, you know, with their, um, with this model minority um, status, right? So I think there's a way in which, um, though we can connect, you know, those aspects together, um, that it's, it's really um, harmful and it's pitted. And I would, I, I think we need to examine more, you know, around um, the continue pitting against um, one another of different racial groups, you know, and I think that's being changed, that's changing. We see more and more of, um, 
of coalitions, organizations working across racial lines. You know, one is um, the um, Asian Americans are very active in contesting the detention centers that's happening in the border, right? They're working with la la Latinx organizations to fight against the detention centers. Um, and of particularly um, active are the Japanese Americans who were interned, right? Who understand, you know, this, this, this kind of detention. And, um, and they have been reaching out and working with Latinx. Same thing with Black Lives Matter. I think there are a lot of Asian Americans, you know, who are working with um, Black organizations, um, community organizations that um, are speaking against um, uh, police brutality, you know, and the injustices that have been long faced by the Black community. So, you know, we, we see those, you know, those two discourses kind of playing out, you know, currently in a two sort of um, uh, forces that are present, you know, and in, um, in current day um, activities. Um, can you remind me of some of the other yeah, questions? Yeah, so just in the last couple minutes, um, the question about how, have you noticed any neg uh, related negative impacts on Asian and or foreign student admissions or research researchers and professors of Asian descent? Right, um, yes, uh, yes. And um, some of it, you know, regards to in regards to the um scientists and the researchers you know that's really coming from um a coordinated effort you know by the and nih along with fbi although i can't you know even though they're working um together it doesn't mean that they have the same um policies or understandings of what's what's going on here um I know that from reading, you know, the materials out there, the NIH actually, you know, sees um, uh, many of the, um, what is it, um, uh, the, the breaking of, of NIH contracts really to do, you know, really to do with negligence, you know, with uh, reporting of, you know, your colleagues, the number of colleagues you talk to, you know, in China, for instance, you have to list everything in your grant reporting. Um, all grants that you had, you know, all, all, um, all the grants you have received, you know, including your speaking engagements, you know, in China and things like that. So many of the incursions, you know, are really those, that type of negligence. I haven't seen of any case where it has come up, you know, as sort of a clear case of espionage, but it's enough to set off, you know, a whole sense of anxiety among um, Asian American communities, especially in the universities and research institutions, you know, that there, there is a fear, you know, it is racial profiling. I mean, when you look at the numbers, you know, 82% of people that the NIH and FBI have targeted are of Asian descent. Um, so we, we are seeing that, um, although many of the universities are speaking up, you know, against it, right? They, they are rejecting this. Um, in regards to the foreign students, I think, you know, there, there is already a ban, you know, on, um, on giving out visas, you know, to foreign students, um, especially for graduate students that are engaged in STEM fields. Um, there's a fear. And when you think about it, it's really interesting, you know, why STEM fields? Why are they targeting and looking at graduate students in the STEM fields? You know, um, and you know, why, you know, I, and again, this is um, the, under the um, possible, you know, um, accusations of espionage and intellectual theft, you know, by these graduate students bringing it back to China. This all goes back to economics. You know, this all goes back to how this knowledge gets integrated into a commodity, right? And the fear is that if the Chinese get a hold of this knowledge, they're able to produce the products that will, you know, and then they will again perpetuate a kind of economic standing, you know, the economic standing of China, you know, which uh, and this goes back to the competition um, between the US and China at the moment, you know, and that it's gonna be ongoing, I think, you know, this is not going to go away, um, even after the elections, I think. Um, uh, I did want to, there was a, I, I have not been in touch with the mayor's office about the task force, but um, it's also interesting that a number of um, these reports are coming from major cities, you know, New York, LA, um, San Francisco, Texas, you know, I mean, Texas is a state, I'm sorry, but like, um, I think Dallas or Houston, I don't know. I don't know where they're coming out of, but you know, those are um, 
places where a lot of um, Asian Americans are in, which is surprising, you know, that, that, that those are the same places where, you know, there's a critical mass, but yet there's also a, you know, a, 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 the number of cases of attacks are much higher. Um, and maybe this has to do with the reporting also, right? There are a lot of things we still don't know that I think we're still kind of assessing um, the information. Well, I think we're just over our hour. I think that's probably a good, good place to end. Uh, on behalf of the Lair of the Golden Bear and the Cal Alumni Association, Professor Laksu, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate you taking the time and um, happy homecoming to everyone. And is there any website or anything you'd like to uh, point people to uh, for more information um, uh, on any of these topics? Yeah, just um, a couple, you know, one is Stop AAPI Hate Crime, right? That's a website that um, was mentioned earlier to report any cases. I also want to alert you, I'm, uh, I'm giving another lecture or talk actually um, next week. Um, and that will be posted um, on the Asian American Asian Diaspora Studies Program website. Um, and um, let's see, or feel free to contact me also, you know, um, you can look me up on um, the Berkeley website and just contact me via, via email. But thank Perfect. you, Mike, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, and go Bears. <laughs>